May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. I hope you've enjoyed or find helpful the, uh, the book by Malcolm Gate that I recommended and some of you managed to get hold of um, over Advent. Well, I'm going to begin today uh, with one of his poems. They came as called according to the law, though they were poor and had to keep things simple. They moved in grace, in quietness and awe, for God was coming with them to his temple. Amidst the outer court's commercial bustle, they'd waited hours, enduring shouts and shoves, buyers and sellers, sensing one more hustle, had made a killing on the two young doves. They came at last with us to candle mass and kept the day the prophecies came true. We glimpsed with them amidst our busyness the peace that Simeon and Anna knew. For candle mass still keeps his kindled light against the dark our Saviour's face is bright. So they come according to the law to do what the law demands. Leviticus says that the offering for um, a child being born and to give thanks is a lamb and a pigeon unless you're poor and then it's two pigeons as Barclay the commentator says the offering of the two pigeons instead of the lamb and the pigeon was technically called the offering of the poor and we are told again that it was into an ordinary house that Jesus was born but they come to the temple. They come to do what the law tells them to do. And they have a, a few meetings with people. The first person they meet is a man called Simeon. Now Simeon has probably heard rumours that there's something going on. Because it looks like he was in the temple a lot of the time. Certainly the news of John the Baptist's birth um, and its meaning was publicised widely. And John the Baptist's father um, served in the temple. So... It would be unheard of for him not to say what, what had happened. The shepherds who heard the angelic announcements may have been shepherds keeping some of the flocks for the temple. And, and yet again, people may have heard rumours. But it wasn't rumours that took him to the temple that day. It was listening to God's word. It was listening to God speaking to him. It was listening for God to speak to him. In the past, God had promised him that he wouldn't die before he saw the Messiah, the anointed one. That he would live to see him come. And it looks like he's been living in the light of that promise. He's been remembering that promise. He's been waiting for that promise. And then God says, go to the temple. We don't know how he was told. We're not told an angel came. That We're not told about a dream or anything else. We're just told that moved by the Holy Spirit, he comes to the temple. And when he comes, he sees this young couple with a small child. And yet, he knows. He knows that this is the one. This babe in arms, this baby who can't speak, who does what all babies do, um, sleep, eat, poop, and repeat that's all the babies can do and well if you don't if you don't do any of those things in the right order at the right time you might get a bit of screaming happening just to let you know it's time for something we don't know what but he comes and he sees this child and he says the words that have become known in the church down through the years as the Nunc Dimittis, um, which basically is Latin for now dismiss. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. I've seen what you promised I would see. It's done. Another poet in the 16th century wrote of um, what he said, saying using these words, I fear no sin, I dread no death. I've lived long enough, I have my life. I've longed enough, I have my love. I've seen long enough, I have my light. I have served enough, I love my saint. I have sorrowed enough, 
I have my joy. Sweet babe, let this psalm serve as a lullaby to thee, as a funeral for me. Oh, sleep in my arms, and let me sleep in thy peace. It was done. This small nation and its most famous son would be known throughout the world. The light would shine from that small nation and flood the world. Simeon had seen the beginning and was willing to let go. I have to tell you that I'm not often like that. I like to see things through to their end. I like to see the things that happen. I'm glad that I've lived long enough to see a grandchild my father didn't live that long. I'm glad that I've seen her begin to grow and to develop. I'm glad that I've seen my children, all of them, whether mine or Ruth's, grow and flourish and be happy. But I long to see more. I long for more. I long to see them go on in that. But here is Simeon. All he's seen is this small child, the potential that is there. And he says, that's enough for me. You've kept your promise, God. You've done what you said you would do. And I trust you for the rest. He wouldn't see the ministry. He wouldn't see the death. He wouldn't see the resurrection. But they would meet again one day. What does he say in this Nunc Dimittis? He says, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. And he saw all of that out of one small child. Oh, we can learn from him. We can learn from him to trust God when he makes his promises. But when God promises something, he promises that all of it and no more. Oh, how sometimes we, we long for things that God does not long to give us, that God has not promised. But what he's promised is enough. What is promised is good and is glorious. And even in this man, in the middle of nowhere, between two great empires, in this small, insignificant place, knew that something special had happened that day and he was content to let it go. The challenge for me, and, and I suppose the challenge for you is, are we content with God's promises? Are we content to receive from him? Do we trust him? Do we hold on to them? And when he prompts, do we act upon it? When he speaks, do we go and not now? Or do we listen? To what he has to say. If he hadn't listened that day, if he'd stayed at home with his breakfast or his dinner or his tea or whatever it was, he wouldn't have meet, met this child. But he did. And then he begins to speak to the parents. And God gives him the words to say because he was there not just for himself, he was there for them too. And he said, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. The rich and powerful would fall. And you know, that's not always a bad thing, even for the rich and powerful. The 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon once wrote, how low was our dear Redeemer brought? How then can we be so proud? If we are not humbled in the presence of Jesus, we don't really know him. We all need to fall. We all need to fall, whether we regard ourselves as rich and powerful or not. We all need to fall. We all need to see him for who he is and see ourselves for who we are and fall at his feet. That's what it's about. The poor in spirit he will cause to rise and he will be a sign that is spoken against. 
uh, it literally is a target that will be shot at. That, that's the literal meaning of the words in Greek. He's going to cause trouble. There was going to be pain. And then he says to Mary, and a sword will pierce your own soul also. It was going to be tough. It was going to be difficult. It was important for Mary to know that mothering the Messiah wouldn't be all sweetness and light. It was a great privilege and a great burden. And though he wouldn't see the crucifixion, Mary would. And she needed to know that it was in God's plan. When God makes his promises to us he doesn't promise us always an easy life he doesn't promise us that everything will go well he doesn't promise that there won't be pain but he tells us that he knows about it and he has his plans in the midst of it so they meet Simeon and it, it's great joy but there's, there's that sadness too and there's that tinge of what the future might hold and then and then they meet Anna um, as it says she was very old she'd got to the age of 84 um, I will be making no comment about that in the middle of this congregation um, there is actually it, it is slightly ambiguous it, it could mean um, that she'd lived with her husband seven years and then for 84 years on she'd been widowed. Now that would make her old. Um, she'd be over 100 by, by that point probably. But as she was there for a different reason. She wasn't there because God had prompted her to come that day. She wasn't there because God had promised that she would meet the Messiah. She was there because she never left the place. She was there because, as the scripture says, she was there day and night never left the temple now i don't think it literally means you know never actually left the temple it's like the saying well you've probably heard of some other people um, i mean i know there's someone that we once knew or you once knew who who never left the place here um but she was always there she was a widow and she longed to know god and she she met with god's people day after day after day She came up to them just as Simeon was finishing what he was saying. And she gave thanks for what she'd heard and for what she'd seen. And she began to, spoke, to speak about the child to everyone who was looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. She came and stumbled upon this meeting but she only heard it and she only found it because she was in the habit of meeting in the temple with God's people and then she told everyone about it I get the impression and it's just an impression from what it says here that she was the kind of person who would talk to anyone about anything that's just an impression but she she went and she told everyone about what she'd heard and what she'd seen. Everyone who was waiting for things to be put right. And we can learn from that too. I'm not saying you need to be in a church building every Sunday. It's not about bums on seats. It's not how many are about how many are in the congregation. But as those who believe in God or those who want to find out about him. We need to be in the company of God's people. Because there are times when things will happen and things will be said and God will do something. And if we're not there, we'll miss out. And I'm not just talking about 10.30 Sunday morning. I'm talking about when you meet with people day by day. I'm talking about having coffee with folk from within the, the fellowship, about praying with people, about, about hearing about someone in need and just popping around and knocking on the door and saying, I heard you went well, can I pray for you? Can I be with you? doesn't tell us how long she lived after that though she was quite old by the time for those days she was very old um, by the time she met with Jesus 
But she talks about him to all who look forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. It's a very strange phrase. They weren't just looking forward to the Romans being chucked out, although just about everyone was looking forward to that. They were looking forward to the Messiah coming who would put things right with God once more. Redemption. That word is a word that, that talks about, that, that means buying people back from slavery, for instance. Paying the price so that they could be free. It talks about a sacrifice made so that people might be forgiven. It's a very strange thing to be talking about, about a small child. But she knew. I know Nicola jumped the gun um, with uh, New Year's. Not a problem. But tomorrow it's traditional to make New Year's resolutions. It's traditional, not to keep them for very long as well, but um, it's traditional to make New Year's resolutions. It's a new year. It's a new beginning. Um, <laughs> Forget all that. You don't have to wait for a new year for things to change. You don't have to wait for a new year for redemption. You don't have to wait for a new year for forgiveness. You don't have to wait to know everything about everything. To say to God, will you forgive me? I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, that, those are words I say quite a lot actually. But um, I don't really know what I'm doing. But will you forgive me? And can I walk with you? As this year ends and the, the new one begins tomorrow. Find that, that new life in him if you haven't already. But be reminded of it if you have. And be like Anna. Be like Anna and talk to those that you meet. When they say what sort of Christmas did you have? Don't just talk about the too much turkey and the... The tree that fell over and um, the uh, annoying relatives. The, not that you have any of you have annoying <laughs> relatives. Um, talk about the one it's all about. The one who brings meaning to it all. The one who brings meaning to everything. And when God speaks, listen. When he promises, believe him. When he prompts you to say something or to do something, take a leap and do it. Remember, we need to fall in order to rise. But God wants to lift us up. And who knows what he will do if we continue to meet with God's people and speak to each other of his goodness and his grace. For he gave everything for us. Sometimes we think of his sacrifice, we think of the cross, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the one who made everything, the one who is responsible for all we see and all we don't see, for all we know and all we couldn't even begin to understand, that one came. Living as a baby, as a small child, as a young man that he might go to the cross for you and I.